Church. Um, our, Christian, uh, um, our scripture reading is from Christian Standard Bible, and it's 1 John 5, verses 18 to 21. <clears throat> we know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who is born of God keeps him, and, e- and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo. And I have the privilege of uh, sharing the Word of God with you this morning as one of the elders and pastors here at Fellowship City. And uh, we have been going through a series uh, titled Real Talk. Um, Through this series, um, we have been handling difficult conversations and bringing the gospel to them. Real Talk, according to the Urban Dictionary, is the philosophy of talking candidly, of talking openly and honestly without fear of what others might think. Real talk is also used to let someone know of something that is hard or something that is challenging that is to come or that is coming. And as a church, we need some real talk at times. And we need to find the biblical answers to those real talk questions or conversations. As a church, we long to see transformation in the lives of our people. We long to see our people grappling with life and flourishing. An autobiography is, a, is a basically an account about someone's life. Trevor Noah has one uh, titled Born a Crime. Uh, Michelle Obama has one titled Becoming. And Nelson Mandela has one with a title Long Walk to Freedom. All these autobiographies with just a title build the account of their subject. Your autobiography is still being written, but what would the title of your autobiography say about you? Would the title post the position you hold at work? What is that title? Would the title of the autobiography be some of your achievements? Would the title of the autobiography be your bank account or investment portfolio? Would it be how to build a successful business? Would it be all about the hustle? What would that title of the autobiography be? So why talk about identity, church? That's a great question. Here's a quote from Tim Keller. The Bible says that our real problem is that every one of us is building our identity on something besides Jesus. We have to understand our identity in order to know who we are. Without understanding our identity, then we're easily deceived into believing or living in different ways that are against our core identity. Our identity enables us to be who we are, and understanding that is an important feat. This morning we will see from the lens of 1 John what our identity is. 1 John, John calls us born of God, calls us of God. This should be the title of our autobiographies. This should be what people know of us. This should be visible in what we do and visible to the world. And that's what we will see John saying. Three points this morning. Truth, life, and love, and we will be out of here this morning. So we are a gospel-centered church, so we always want to give a nice overview of the text that we're looking at so that it we put it in context. So First John is a poem. You will see a Bible project image behind me. So First John is a poem which has most of its ideas from the book of John, from chapters 13 to 17. So First John is written as part of a collection of, of poems or letters which includes Second and Third John, which you'll see on the far side of that image. So Second and, and, and Third John are specifically written to a church and an individual respectively. But First John addresses the main crisis experienced by the house churches because of the division caused by deceivers. These are house churches that are in Ephesus. Um, John writes this letter to them, 
and he writes it in a poem format. We say that it's in a poem format because it is not a linear way of argumenting or putting forward an argument, but rather there are three main ideas throughout the whole letter that keep circulating throughout the whole letter. So the three main ideas that John speaks about is life, love, and truth. These three themes of life, love, and truth express themselves as believing the truth and living a transformed life as a consequence of believing the truth. And living a transformed life is living a life of love. And that's what we, we will see as we grapple with this text this morning. So John throughout expresses this truth, this life, and this love in different ways. John challenges the house churches and challenges us as we read this letter this morning to examine ourselves so that we are not deceived or living lives that falsely reflect what we believe. Some of the deception is mentioned in chapter 4. We see John saying, test the spirits in John, 1 John chapter 4. It reads as follows, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Verse 6 says, we are from God. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. So John is saying that we need to test the spirits so that we are not deceived. So you already know that the world can be deceptive, but he's also saying that even within the boundaries of the church, there may be deception. So we test the spirit using the word of God. We see love mentioned as well. So in chapter 4, um, verse 7, it says, Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And verses 20 says, We have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. So it's part of the three themes that intertwine to create this letter. John is saying, test and examine yourself. If you don't love, then you don't know God. And I'm sure as I say that some people pat themselves on the back because they love. But John is also saying, if you love, like Beyonce says in her song, me, myself, and I, then you don't know God and you need Christ. Yes, I do know that song by Beyonce. But please get that one out of your mind and remember that that's not the love you should have. Not me, myself, and I. You should have love for your brothers and sisters. Love for others. As you will be seeing now, the whole poem has these three themes, truth, life, and love. Believing the truth, living a transformed life, living a life of love throughout chapter 5. We will focus on specifically verses 18 to 21, which Leon, Leon read for us this morning. So just a quick side road as we start. But let me pray for us before we get into that side road. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can come before your throne and that by your Holy Spirit that you would speak to us, that you would um, enable us to hear your voice. So this morning, remove all the distractions from us. Calm our hearts, uh, our minds, and our spirits. May you, through the Holy Spirit, tell us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do. And we pray that we may see and become transformed from the truth of the gospel. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a quick side road. We speak about deception or being deceived. This is a picture of chicken wings. So I grew up eating chicken chicken wings. Um, they I almost said they are the best. They were the best. Um, Nguenya, one of my good friends, would vouch that I grew up eating these wings. Uh, he's seen me eat them many times. I thought chicken chicken wings were the best, so I thought I was not deceived. Then AJ took me to a chicken spot in Dwerenkloof, uh, little to know that I was living a life of deception. I was deceived. <laughs> chicken chicken was not the best wings. Since then, I have not had any chicken chicken wings. If you think you're a Christian, if you think you're a believer in Christ, <laughs> you, you want to know the spot? Okay. It is, it is Bird and Co. in Durant. 
the, the best wings you can have. Bird, bird and co. In Kruentwurf, yes. In that's, that's the one, church fam. So not chicken and wings, that's deception. Bird and co. If you think you are a Christian, if you think you are a believer in Christ, but there is no transformation while you live as if you're a child of God and, until death, but only realize at the point of death that there is no transformation, that there is a false Christianity that you believe, there may not be time. So this morning, we will see John asking and pleading with us to test our hearts, to hear the Holy Spirit this morning, if the Holy Spirit is speaking. You cannot save yourself, nor can you be deceived and still be saved. You cannot love yourself or want to be yourself without God. This is a paradox. Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis in a book titled Mere Christianity. So C.S. Lewis says, It is no good trying to be myself without him. The more I resist him and try to live on my own, the more I become dominated by my own heredity and upbringing and surroundings and natural desires. In fact, what I so profoundly call myself becomes merely the meeting place for trains of events which I never started and which I cannot stop. So like from the image of our, 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 our sermon this morning, you may be just a shadow, a meeting place for trains of events which are dominated by things unless you have your identity rooted in Christ. So let's look at our first point, truth. Truth means a fact or a belief that is accepted as true. So according, that's according to the Oxford Dictionary. Three times in verses 18 to 21, we see the words, we know. And once we see we may know, we'll get to the we may know at the end. But three times we see the words, we know. And this is used to indicate that what is coming is known by the listener, is known by the audience. And if you're a believer, you should know this. The first we know is in verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin, but the one who is born of God keeps him. In context, John is addressing some deception that was based on outward sin not affecting the inner person, which gave way to prostitution. So John says in 1 John 3 verse 7 to 9, Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this person to destroy the devil's work. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin. John is speaking about habitual sin in this, in this moment. John is saying you can't be stuck in sin because if you, if, if you have known God. If you're a Christian, then God keeps you, and because God keeps you, the evil one does not touch you or have a stronghold over you. We know that John is speaking about habitual sin because he also says if anyone sees a fellow believer committing a sin, that doesn't lead to death, he should ask and God will give life to him. So the first we know is that being a child of God means that we're not stuck in habitual sin and it means that God keeps us. This is a certainty as John is placing it. This is a truth that God will keep us from sin. The second we know is in verse 19. Verse 19 reads as follows, We know that we are of God and the whole world is under the sway of the evil one. So verse 19 is a repeat of 1 John 2 verse 15. Basically, don't love the world and everything in the world. John says that if we love the world, then we don't know God because he contrasts being of God and being of the evil one. Being of God means that Christ gave himself for us so that we are his, which means we will be different and, uh, uh, from the evil one. Real talk, Paul is very clear. If you're stuck in habitual sin, stuck in doing wrong, coveting what is not yours, like your neighbor's car house or the green grass next door, if you're stuck in porn or lust, if you place things more important in your life than God, like family, like your spouse, like your degrees, your job title, your hustle, business, investment, retirement, travel, money, sports, if you place these things, then you may be stuck in idolatry, which we'll see as we continue. If you find your identity in these things, your identity in your job title, 
in your investments, if you find your identity in your marriage, if, if your identity is in yourself, your strength, then you do not know God. So how do you know if your identity is something in something other than God? Here's an easy way to test, like John says we should. What do you spend most of your time thinking about? How do others define you as well? If that definition is not a child of God, but other things, then maybe there are idols and or sin. Maybe you don't know God. So real talk, if you love things of the world, then you might need to test whether you do know God. Real talk. John says we know three times. These are truths that John believes are known to the audience. The question is, do we know these truths? Do you know that if you're a believer, if you put your faith in Christ, then you are not a slave to sin, that God keeps you? Do you know that your life ought to be different from the people who don't know God, from people who, under, who are under the sway of the evil one? John says that we should know this. So do we know it? Your priorities ought to be different. Your choices about your time should be different. Your choices about your money should be different. Your choices about how you use your gifts, your knowledge, your working ability should be different than someone who does not know God. That is how we know if we do know what John is speaking about here. Let's look at the third we know in verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one, that is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. John says we can only know God if we know the Son of God. The Son of God is Jesus, as we see in verse 20. So Jesus is God, and we can only know God if we know Jesus, if we are in him, meaning if we have put our faith and trust in his finished work for us on the cross for our sins. John uses the word know again, or we may know. This time, this word speaks more to an experiential knowing of Jesus. So not knowing about Jesus, but knowing Jesus, knowing who he is, having a relationship with him. The mention of being in the true one speaks about, our, uh, the, about the authenticity of God. John, in context, speaks against false prophets by pointing to the only true God who should be followed, and only true God who should be known. The last part of verse 20 should remind us of the words from John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So eternal life is only if you know God, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, who was sent to redeem us back to God the Father. He is the true and only God, no other gods. There aren't many other gods. There isn't a God for every culture. There isn't a God for every country or continent or religion. Any other gods are false except believing in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your and my sins. That's the truth. Let's look at our second point, life. Our lives ought to be different as a result of the truth we know. We should be who we are already in Christ today if we have put our faith and trust in him. This means the foundation for our life is different because of our identity. We are children of God. We are born of God at second birth because of putting our faith and trust in God. We often hear and teach people to do so some of the do's are read the Bible, attend church, join city group, discipleship, join a serving space. The motivation of these things should be out of a new identity as children of God. Without an experience of who God is, without knowing who God is, without intimacy with God, then these things we ought to do are empty tasks and sometimes tasks that are too hard for us to do. What is intimacy with God? It is having an encounter with God such that you know experientially who God is. If you have an encounter or meeting with God, then you are changed and transformed because the we know now becomes experiential knowledge and reality. 
Knowing God or having intimacy with God is what helps us to understand our identity as children of God. Out of our identity as children of God, we are changed and desire to live transformed lives because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Transformed lives then include some of the things that make us who we are, or some of the things that include reading the Bible, because that is how we hear from God. That is how God speaks to us. That is how intimacy with God starts. We attend church because that is where we meet and fellowship with other like-minded, believing brothers and sisters. We attend city groups or discipleship spaces because that is where we deepen our understanding and expression of our faith. That is where we can give of our time, talents, and treasures. That is where we can express and live out our identity as children of God. That is why we do these things out of our identity as children of God. Verse 21 says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. John has not yet spoken about idols so far, but he includes this in the summary of 1 John. Guard yourselves from idols. Idols are basically things that take the place of God in our lives. God should be first if we know him as Lord. God should be priority. So idols are things that take priority and adoration of God onto that thing that we put our adoration and priority on. Tim Keller says, if anything becomes more fundamental than God to your happiness, meaning of life and identity, then it is an idol. So idols can be things we give too much attention and priority to, like work. So work can consume the individual and become part of the identity. Without work, you don't have value. Without work, you are nothing. And that is an idol then, taking root. Idols can be recreation as well. Things like swimming, things like netball, running, golf, or gym, to mention a few. If you find your identity in them, if you find your identity in the compliments of how much weight you can lift, or the Strava screenshots of how long you've run, or your ever-decreasing handicap, handicap in golf, if these recreational activities take all of our time, all of our money, and we utilize all of our talent, and if, if they are the reason we don't have time to be with God and have intimacy with God and be with God's people, then these things are idols. If you wake up every morning and check social media or the news first, then it may be an idol, taking the place and priority of God in your heart. If you go to sleep after watching that or binge watching that last series and have not spent time with God, then maybe that's an idol. The word God means protecting against damage or watch over in order to protect and control. So there's something important here to protect, which is our hearts and our identity. <clears throat> if you have a box, this is a picture of a box behind me. If you don't know what is inside it, it would be hard to guard that box, right? As opposed to knowing that there's a treasure or something far more valuable, then it would be easier to guard against it. So if you don't know your identity or you don't know your heart, then it is easy for you to not guard your heart from idols. But if you know that your heart is under contention by the evil one and you know your identity, then you're far more able to guard it. We ought to understand that idols have a way of stealing or gripping our heart and identity from what it should be. Our hearts and identity is in God because we are of God and not of the world. This is why we need to guard ourselves from the idols so that we're not fooled or swayed but firmly rooted in our identity as children of God. Real talk. You cannot be you without God. The world and culture says that you can be a better you, says you can trust in yourself, but no fam. John says that through Jesus who brings us to the Father and grants us eternal life, we have our identity and purpose as children of God. We are wired to find our identity vertically, but our own personal struggles cause us to find our identity horizontally. We are wired to find our identity vertically because we are designed to have a relationship with God. Sin has caused the desire for us to be the God of our own lives. This is part of the struggle that causes us to find our identity horizontally. 
find our identity in the world, find our identity from things of the world and not things of God. Real talk. We have a choice, fam. We can either live a life based on the truth about God, live a transformed life because of God, or we can live in the perceived pursuit of joy, which is actually empty and hollow from idolatry. So how do we live a transformed life? First, by beholding the truth. The truth that God sent his son so that we can have life, so that we can have eternal life. Verses 12 and 13 of chapter 5 says, The one who has the Son has life. The one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I have written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. God enables us to not live in sin, to not be entrenched in idolatry. God enables us to not love the world by giving us a new identity so that we are of God. We're children of God. If we experientially know Jesus, if we have a relationship with him, if he is our cornerstone, the foundation of our life and identity, that is how we behold this truth. Let's look at our last point. Love. To know love or to live a life of love, we first need to understand love. John gives us a great understanding in 1 John 4 verse 9. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So God sent his son to die for us so that we may live. God has to send his son because he's a just God and because of sin we are estranged from him and we would face his wrath. That is why he sends his son. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We see the same love in 1 John 5 verse 20. The son of God has come and his coming has enabled us to know him as the true one in his death and resurrection for us. He is the Son of God. This love says a lot about what God thinks about us. He gave his one and only Son to give us life. God sent Jesus to die a shameful death for you and me as the greatest act and sign of love. Verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know the true one. We are in the true one. That is, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God in eternal life. So what does this say about what God thinks of us? Sons and daughters of God. When Katejo My firstborn daughter arrived. I felt a big sense of love. I was meeting my daughter. She she will always be my daughter, no matter what she does. So far more than that feeling is how God the Father sees us as sons and daughters. Far more than that feeling I would have felt. That even when we didn't know him, he made a way for us to be redeemed back to him through Jesus' son. Fam, we have an inheritance as sons and daughters. That is how God sees us. That's, how God, that's what God would say of us. We have eternal life. Another one is we are valuable to God. That is how he sees us. We are valuable to God. We have the spirit of God. God enables the spirit to dwell within us. This is how he keeps us with the spirit at work, transforming our lives to be more and more like Christ, to desire things of eternal standing than things of worldly emptiness. We ought to look to Jesus, whom the Spirit is constantly pointing to. We need to be transformed to be more and more like Christ. Our life is found in Him. We see this in verse 20. We cannot be ourselves without Him. Our lives are found in Him. This is already how God sees us. So we need to be who we already are in Christ. Not in work, not in leisure, not in the hustle, not in our family, not in our wealth, not in our self-made security, not in our desires, not in lust, 
not in pride, but in Christ. We are sons and daughters. We are loved. We ought to be different, fam. The world ought to see us and see God. Not how good we are, not how popular, not how educated, not how successful, but how we are in God. That is how the world ought to see us. As we close, it is important to understand our identity. Our identity is rooted in God. Without God, we cannot be ourselves. We know, it has been mentioned three times, and it speaks about the truth this morning in the text we look at. We know God. If we know God, then we are not enslaved by habitual sin. God keeps us through his Holy Spirit. If we know God, then we are not of this world. We are different. We are not bound and should not love the world because the world is under the evil one. If we know God, then we are children of God. We are of God. Christ gave himself for us. We are in Jesus. We are sons and daughters of God, and we have eternal life through Jesus. That is our identity. You may be wondering what are some next steps for me, or what should I do with this identity? Here are some next steps. If you're a child of God, then you ought to have a relationship with God. This means spending time with God. If you wake up in the morning, the first thing you do is check social media or WhatsApp statuses, or if the last thing you do before sleeping is binge on TV, when do you have time to build intimacy with God? When do you hear from God? If you say that you no longer hear from God or you no longer hear God speaking as clearly as he did when you were a newer or younger believer, then I will ask, do you read the Bible? Because that is how you hear from God. The Bible is the only way to build intimacy with God, for that is how God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. So next steps, test yourself. How often do you read the Bible? How often do you spend time with God? How often do you scroll on social media, check WhatsApp statuses, go to gym, go for a run? How do your priorities line up? Intimacy with God should be the most important thing. You should seek and spend time reading the Bible and and ask others to hold you accountable or to read with you. Next steps, seek out the idols that you may be guarding yourself from. If you don't seek them out, then how will you know what they are? How will you know those things contending for your heart? Are you not deceived? Here are a couple of good ways to try and seek them out. What is the first thing or last thing that you do in the day? What are the most used apps on your phone? Because we spend the most, a lot of time on our phones. What are the things that you do the most during the week for leisure? What do your closest and trusted friends say about the idols they see? So seek out those idols that you should guard yourself from. Next steps, commit to being generous with your time, talents, and treasure. San Marie and Jake, if you can can come up to lead us in the last song. Here are a couple of easy things. Listen to Reno's sermon from last week about treasure. I'm not going to speak about treasure this morning, but let's talk about talents. God has uniquely wired us all with different talents and gifts. So are you using yours or do you save that only for the corporate space? Next steps, find a space to serve. There are many spaces to serve. Come speak to me or speak to one of the different ministry leaders that you may see in the different ministry spaces. Do you ask questions about the things you see in and around the church? Why not? Maybe God through the Holy Spirit is laying in your heart something you could be doing. To come, speak to come speak to myself or to Reino. That's talents. Okay, let's speak about time for a moment. Commit to being with and around God's people. That's an easy one. Coming to church weekly shouldn't be on the basis that you're not busy. You should commit to coming to church and not have leisure, like I'm too tired, like I want to clean, I have to run a marathon, I have to study for that test. There are a whole lot of other excuses, but what we will notice with these excuses is that they are keeping you away from spaces where you can meet and encounter God. Your spirit will be refreshed even though your body may be still tired if you come to church, even if you're tired. How effective will not coming to church be for your soul? You can clean after church. Studying is only an excuse 
if you'll be studying the whole day without a two-hour break because that is how long church lasts. Also, what were you doing the day before? You can run marathons on Saturday. If you still want to, you can go for an afternoon run on Sunday. Just check and test your heart that your excuses for not coming to church are not empty. And it doesn't have to be Fellowship City, fam. It's whatever church that you believe God has called you to for the season. Meeting and being with God's people is important. So commit to that. Commit to being in discipleship spaces. Are you praying or reading the Bible with other people? Are you being transformed by the Word of God through the Holy Spirit as you continuously engage with the Word of God? How often do you engage the Word of God? Commit to being intimate with God. Create a space either in the morning or in the evening or before you walk into the doors at work or on your commute with God. Listen to sermons, listen to audio Bibles in the car as you travel. How much time do you listen to the radio or news or scroll social media compared to what you should be doing in being intimate with God? In a moment, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray specifically for people who are maybe desiring intimacy with God, desiring to know Him more. Intimacy with God is the start of finding our identity. I also want to pray for people who are feeling and battling with living out of their identity. If you find things that are constantly waging war against your time, against your talent, against your treasure, things constantly fighting for your heart and mind, things making you tired, things making you anxious and hopeless, let's close our eyes as we pray. Lord, this morning, we come before your throne and want to acknowledge the truth that we are not ourselves without you. We need you. And we thank you for the truth that we are your children. That we are in Christ. That we are loved. We pray that you would enable that truth to seep in our hearts. And if this is the prayer of our hearts, and I pray that if this is one of the people that are here this morning, that in their hearts they would be committing to creating and finding spaces of intimacy with you, Lord God. I pray that by your Holy Spirit that you would be at work enabling them to find and see those spaces of intimacy with you. And I pray as well for people who are anxious, people who are maybe finding things that are waging war against them in their time. And I pray that through your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that you would draw them near to yourself. That they would know experientially the love of Christ. That Christ died on the cross for their sins to give them life. That is a radical kind of love. I pray for comfort and peace for those who are struggling with anxiety, but I pray that they would remember the truth that you keep them, Lord God, and that they would bow, bow the knee and come to you. They would seek you. I pray that we would build out intimacy with you, Lord God, because that is where we find and we will find our identity. I pray that we would encounter and meet you regularly in spaces of worship or spaces where we meet with other believers and as we encounter and, and, and see you and experience you, that our lives would be changed and we would be transformed. I pray that, Lord, now as we sing Cornerstone, as we sing in Christ alone, that these words would, be ring, would, be, would ring true in our hearts, they would remain in our hearts. As we remember that only in Christ do we find our identity. In Jesus' name, amen.